I'll just welcome you to our regular meeting of the Boulder Valley Board of Education for Tuesday, July 21st. Laura, would you please call the roll? Garcia. Here. Gephardt. Here. Marquis. Here. Myers. Here. Sergeant. Here. Sweeney Moran. Here. Zess. Here. Okay, please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge my allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, of the United States of America and to the, and republic, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, we're going to move right into executive session. And um, we need uh, a motion and uh, just to clarify on the record that we have issues to discuss as follows confer with the board's attorney concerning legal matters and to receive legal advice on pending litigation matters for crs 246402 b okay could someone make a motion so moved Gina. okay richard and second by kathy yep okay and laura would you please call the roll to convene into executive session Garcia. Here. Yes. Gephardt. Yes. Marquis. Yes. Myers. Yes. Sergeant. Yes. Sweeney Moran. Yes. Zis. Yes. Motion passes. Okay, so now I think we all need to log out and log back in, correct? All of the board members and Kathleen and Rob should log out of the Zoom meeting and uh, log into the Google Meet. Okie dokie, see you later. All right, uh, thank you for joining us this evening for our July 21st special meeting. Um, I'd like to remind everybody that the mission of the Boulder Valley School District is to create challenging, meaningful, and engaging learning opportunities so that all children are prepared for successful civically engaged lives. Um, and I'll just make a comment also that we scheduled this meeting a few weeks ago, actually on our last meeting on June 29th, just realizing the changing environment that we're in and how much conditions are impacting how we open schools. So the board had asked for an update from the district on just where we are today and how things are um, influencing what our students' uh, school experience might look like in the fall. So with that, um, Rob, do you want to start with the superintendent report? Thank you, Board President Marquez, uh, board members. I am not going to give a report this evening. I know that we have uh, folks that are watching. We have guests that are helping us out. Um, other than thank you to all of our um, graduates and all of our families uh, and community members who have been attending our graduations. We have another one tonight and graduations all this week, all most at Rec Field. Uh, Saturday will be at Netherland uh, Junior Senior High School. Um, so I wanna thank everybody for coming out and looking forward to our conversation today around reintroduction. Okay. Um, so our next item is, uh, so you don't have any questions for Rob, sorry. Okay, our next item is board communication. Uh, anyone want to add anything before we get into the main presentation? Okay, Stacy. To say that I had the honor of being at Boulder High's graduation yesterday, and it was just a wonderful event. Both ceremonies were so well done and really meaningful, although they were hot. Um, <laughs> it was just a great, great celebration of our graduates. And so I just wanted to say a special thank you to everyone who made that possible and for all the graduations that are happening this week because I assume they will be exactly as meaningful. Okay, so Lisa's hand go up. Yeah, I'm hearing that there are a lot of people who can't get into the meeting, that it's not loading with bandwidth or that folks are getting booted. I'm wondering if we have any anything we can say about that. Randy. Okay. Yes, um, we, we have been working with the company. It looks like we are back online and everything should be up to speed now. Okay, thanks. Okay, Kitty. Um, 
I want to echo Stacy a little bit. I was at Broomfield's graduation this morning, and it wasn't nearly as hot as it was yesterday, but it wasn't very comfortable in the second one, but it was wonderful. The, it was great to see the kids. They were clearly so excited that they actually got to graduate. And you know, I just want to thank everybody who made this happen and are making all the other graduations happen because it's you know, not what it was before, and it really was a wonderful experience. Okay, Richard. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. I, I was at the Arapahoe Ridge graduation, and it was not at Rectfield. It was right there at Arapahoe Ridge. And they did a parade kind of sort of graduation where the graduates would be in their car and then uh, uh, a train of, of other cars that were part of their families that would follow them. And it was just a great, great uh, uh, process that they used and very enjoyable. It was hot. And Kathy was there, uh, and uh, she may want to say something, but it was it was pretty good to see all the families and their uncles and their aunts and everybody in the car and uh, in their cars. So it was a wonderful event. Great, Kathy. I just will join what Richard said. I thought it was a creative way to allow whole families to come and participate in the graduation. So, so kudos to being creative and thinking of ways to celebrate the kids. And Donna, do you have any comments? Okay. Uh, so then uh, if that's it, we'll move on to our next item, which is an update on the reintroduction plan for fall of 2020. All right. Well, thank you, Tina and uh, Randy. Are you going to pull up the slide deck or am I going to be uh, driving that. I am pulling it up now. Just give me half okay. a second. Very good. My apologies. I just told join what Richard said that I thought it was a creative way to allow whole families to come and participate in the graduation. So, so kudos to being creative and thinking of ways to celebrate the kids. And Donna, do you have any comments? Okay. I was trying. So then, uh, that's I was, it. I was, to our next item, which is an update on the reintroduction. Just double checking, Randy, can you hear me? I can't get all these things open at once. Can everybody hear me okay? You're okay. I can, I can, I can hear, hear you, Rob. Okay, wonderful. I can, okay, I um, we're, we're excited to provide the board an update on our reintroduction plan uh, this evening. Uh, as, as I know the board understands and hopefully the, the public understands as well, um, there may never have been a more complex problem that school districts have been challenged to solve. Um, not only the, the number of complexities in the amount of decisions that need to be made, uh, but the lack of time and, and ever-changing information uh, that we are having to consider um, as we think about reintroduction. And so our team has spent hundreds, if not thousands and thousands of hours really trying to put this district and our community in the best position possible uh, as we think about uh, what our plan might be. And we've, we're, we're, we're hashtag back together BBSD because we very much are excited about the potential of being back together. Uh, Randy, if you go to our next slide, please. Um, as we started this work, board members, you'll know that we tried to set four distinct priorities, regardless of the phase that, that we attempt to return in, that we've been trying to focus on. First and foremost, health, well-being, and safety of all students and staff. We want to make sure that we maximize student academic growth. That we want to provide our people the support they need to feel comfortable and be ready um, to take on whatever phase it is that, that we enter. We want to make sure that, that what we um, present to you is operationally and financially viable. So, next slide. Just as, as a reminder to the board and the public, um, we've really looked at this next year, the 2021 school year, um, as um, as that there's going to be multiple phases that during the course of the next 12, if not 24 months, that school district, our school district will be required to, to, um, to toggle between. Uh, these are our, our phases, phase one, two, three, four, and five. 
Um, and as the board has seen this and has approved this five phase plan, um, we feel like that this plan gives us the ability to pivot in the ways that we'll need to pivot to make sure that not only are we meeting the needs of our community and meeting the needs of our kids, but keeping people safe at the same time. So our plan, I will, I will tell you board members, um, next slide Randy, that there are two thresholds that we're trying to meet as a school district. And I feel that school districts across the country will be trying to meet. The first threshold is which phase do we re-enter in where we, um, in working hand in hand with Boulder County uh, and Boulder Co and Broomfield Public Health, um, that we are able to enter in a way that is safe or at least mitigates the risks that are, are um, associated with COVID-19. Um, so those are plans that, 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 as we think about the threshold, which the plan will meet the, that threshold in making sure that um, it meets the, the approval of our health officials. And then I think another, a higher threshold and a more challenging threshold is not um, does the data and science and health officials, do they, do they tell you that, that they feel like the risks are, are low enough to come back to school? How do we make sure that our people feel safe? And I would say the second one is a higher threshold and is certainly challenging. I know personally have received um, you know, hundreds of emails over the course of the past week. Board members, I know you've received those as well. Um, we've also been engaging uh, our, our community, our teachers um, on Let's Talk BVSD was a web website that we've set up to have this conversation. So as we think about meeting these two different thresholds, that is the challenge that we have. Randy, next slide. Based on our work with, with both Boulder County Public Health and Broomfield Public Health, um, we are attempting, and my recommendation at this point, is to attempt to move into phase three when we come back. Now, there's a lot of caveats around this recommendation. First and foremost, we have a month between now and when school is going to start. And I think we'd be naive to think that that data may or may not change. And I think, and I, I believe that we have a responsibility to react to, to both sets of data in regards to, um, you know, our, our employees um, feeling safe and, and the health department data uh, that would allow us to, to, to know whether or not going into that phase is safe. Um, so phase three, I know that we had, the last time we had talked and last time we had updated our community, we were thinking phase four, that we would be able to move towards phase four. Um, I think when you hear from Jeff Zayak from Boulder County Public Health, he can share with you um, why we think that phase three is a better um, entry point than phase four at this point with the uptick in cases that we have seen. Um, so, not without challenge, but our goal at this point is to try to move forward with phase three. Uh, Randy, next slide. And, and I will share with you as, as we think about the challenges that we'll be up against and being able to pull this off and make this work. Um, I was reminded of what can happen when people come together, work hard, um, don't give up. Um, during these past two days when we've sat in in-person graduations, which at one point we did not feel like would be possible. And I can tell you after watching um, almost, uh, you know, four to 500 graduates on each day cross that stage and how thankful they were, it is just, it is proven to me that, that it, is, it is worth taking on these complex challenges to do everything we can to try to uh, make what we think work um, that is best for kids. And I think that if you were to talk to any superintendent and, and most of our teachers, uh, what they would share with you is that in-person learning is much more effective and there's so many more benefits than if we just go fully online, even with the challenges that I know that we'll have to overcome. So at this point, what I'd like to do is we're going to um, ask Rob Price to make some presentations on some of the, the physical safety um, environments and, and things that we're going to be doing. Uh, in regards to trying to enter and uh, come back in phase three. And then I will have Margaret Crespo report on what does the actual phase three model look like um, from an instructional standpoint. I'll come back and share some more, in, um, some more information in regards to how are we going to continue to work with our employees to try to make sure that phase three is, is, is a phase where they feel safe in returning. Um, and then we'll hear from Jeff Zayak who's going to provide us um, just some thoughts from public health and then um, and Dr. Urbina is here as well from Boulder County Public Health to help us answer any questions. Um, so I'd ask the board, the board if we could get through these next 
um, next few slides and then wait till the end and then begin to start to field your questions. I think that would help us be the most efficient if that works for you, Tina. Yep, sounds good. Very good. So with that, I'll turn it over to Rob Price. Dr. Anderson, thank you. Uh, Randy, was you mind pulling? There we go. Randy's on top of it. So just over the next few slides, we'll cover the mitigation strategies that will be implemented to protect both uh, staff and students. And I just want to say that this is countless, countless hours of research, great alignment with our public health partners, um, and great teamwork as you're thinking through this. So uh, based on the guidance from uh, public health and CDE, students and staff will be required to wear fabric face coverings unless the individual has a health or educational reason they don't have to wear a face covering. So we had discussions about only requiring staff, which has proved to be less effective because the face coverings do not fully protect the wearer from the droplets. So again, this is in alignment with what public health is telling us, masks are most effective for reducing spread from, from people who are infected by containing the droplets. Um, we understand that children in early elementary ages will have a difficult time wearing masks all day. So nonetheless, we will uh, make efforts to encourage um, compliance and provide what we'll call mask breaks throughout the day. And those will be breaks probably outside of weather allows where we, contain, uh, where we can maintain social distancing, et cetera. Um, these are the measures um, that really are essential to limiting the virus transmission. So mask wearing, hand washing, maintaining uh, physical distancing, staying home when you're sick are all the essential measures and the most effective to limit transmission of the virus. So these measures, um, all four measures are accounted for in our plan that we'll be uh, reviewing tonight. Next slide. So this is a graphics, what a, a, a graphic of what a classroom will look like uh, at the start of school. So the measures that are being implemented are first, as you'll see at the front of the classroom, a 24 inch by 36 inch desktop partition will be provided to teachers. And those will be used primarily when we have one-on-one -on -one instruction occurring and we cannot maintain six foot social distancing. So think of that one-on-one -on -one instruction where a teacher's sitting alongside a desk and uh, you know, both students, both the student and the teacher have masks on, but we thought a partition would provide better protection. Um, face shields, safety glasses will also be provided to our staff, but those will be optional, essential protective gear for those staff members. Changes to our ventilation systems have been made and uh, accounted for as we're looking at the start of school. So we've increased the amount of fresh air being brought into our classrooms as much as possible to really the idea here is reduce the concentration of airborne contaminants such as the virus in our classrooms. So we've also changed out our filters in preparation of the start of school. And then we will be strongly encouraging classroom teachers to be using the outdoors as much as possible and whether it allows. Phase three also allows us to maintain six foot of social distancing in our classroom. So Desks will be staggered accordingly, and then we'll be planning for that. So what does that provide is right now research shows us that most droplets uh, fall to the ground within that three to six foot distance. So I think we've been highly discussed, um, but trying to maintain that six feet is extremely important in this plan. Passive screening, which isn't shown here, will also take place to prevent staff and students from coming in our buildings that have COVID-19. Signage will be installed again to promote physical distancing, mask wearing, hand washing, et cetera. So all of that is, is in the works uh, to be installed before the first day of school. And then uh, this will be difficult, but restricting non-essential visitors such as our volunteers in our schools until we can ensure all of our protocols, protocols are being followed. So from a visitor management system, we just wanna make sure that we know who is in our building, that passive screening has been so, next slide, Randy. So, clean work counts. This is a graphic. Um, sorry. So, custodial teams. Uh, there was a news article on Channel Four. If you saw that last night, but custodial team, teams will continue to focus on regular cleaning and the high-touch surfaces, as the research has indicated. 
But right now, evidence right now is telling us cleaning is particularly important for high touch surfaces as listed here, doorknobs, computers, faucets, um, water bottle fillers, desks, seats, et cetera. So all we're trying to do here is eliminate the hazard before a student or a staff member becomes in contact with it. So uh, cafeteria tables and chairs will be cleaned in between student groups. We're also recommending, highly recommending that we're limiting the sharing of supplies and equipment as much as possible. If we can't, then we're gonna have to clean those supplies in between student groups. I wanna talk a little bit about transportation. As uh, I've talked many times, this has been one of our most difficult hurdles to get over. So we uh, are encouraging families to consider alternative modes of transportation, such as walking, biking, and then what we're calling the three block challenge of park, if you have to drive to a school, park three blocks away, walk in, minimize the traffic dangers that we're gonna have around our schools and minimize the pollution around our schools. So, if families elect to use the school bus services, parents will be required to screen their students before they get on the bus. They'll have to practice social distancing while they're waiting on the bus. The driver and all students will be required to wear a mask while they're on the bus. And then as this drawing reflects and as approved by Boulder County Public Health and Broomfield, we'll be allowed a maximum of two students per seat so we built our transportation uh, plan accordingly. And this is what's important, uh, but based on what we know today, capacity will be limited to those students with transportation in their IEP, transportation eligible preschool students, and transportation eligible elementary students. We have not built in the capacity yet. We, we just need a little bit more time to study middle school and high school. But right now we are confident with the two student per seat that we can serve all the way through the elementary students or elementary schools and serve our uh, special education population and our preschool students. So we will be rolling out a opt-in for transportation services. We previously presented that to the Board of Education. That will be rolling out to parents in a newsletter in the upcoming weeks. It's gonna be extremely important that parents uh, take advantage of that so we know who needs transportation. But I will say, going back, we're really highly recommending parents take advantage of other alternative forms that are safer, um, such as walking and biking, if at all possible. So um, more to come on this in the coming weeks through communication. Um, with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Crespo. Thanks very much, Rob. Good evening, everyone. Uh, super excited to be here and share our update around phase three. I've had the opportunity over the last couple of months to provide updates on a regular basis. I'm gonna take a few seconds and answer some of the high level questions that have come up related to um, obviously our reintroduction and our, and our planning. And, uh, and then I'll get a little bit deeper into our slides. So the first thing I'd like to share is we've had a lot of questions around professional learning uh, and I wanted to take a second to just explain what we've been doing. Um, thank all of our countless teachers and staff who've spent hours and hours working on uh, professional learning, our HR department. So to begin with, we've done uh, a number of training opportunities will be coming forward based on Seesaw, Schoology, and Pear Deck. We're very excited to also announce that we have two courses specifically for blended learning, and those will be ready to go by mid-August. Um, we have a reintroduction PD coming on August 13th that will focus on SEL, building a community in a blended or virtual setting, knowing that that might be an option moving forward. Our assessment, which includes Illuminate training, specifically related to instruction, which are classroom rituals, routines, differentiation, blended learning, and the unit plan overview. Digital citizenship and data privacy training will also occur in August. I think this is really important. We've had a lot of questions from parents and from our community asking what that might look like and definitely plays directly into our next couple of slides as I move forward. I'll also share that we will have parent courses and resources on Schoology and Seesaw ready to go by mid-August and they will be both in English and in Spanish. They'll be recorded and we're also hoping to have live opportunities for streaming. Many parents have asked us about platforms and we're here to help. We have both a help desk and IT Prime, as well as um, a clear indication for platforms moving forward. So for our families, PK3 will be using Seesaw 
saw as the platform, which definitely plays directly into the needs of our elementary students. And then Schoology 4 through 12. Many of our teachers use Google, Google Classroom and it will continue to be a tool that content be, can be linked to and embedded to in Schoology so that all families grade four through 12 can focus on navigating just one platform. We've really tried to listen to the feedback that we've heard from our community. So our goal is to be robust and relevant. And I will share that our incredible teachers and staff have created units that will support teachers in delivering instruction online, in person, and through a blended, blended online learning. We have a level of ingenuity and support that we would never have thought possible just four short months ago. As an example, when school opens, we are excited to announce a bank of over a thousand short videos recorded by our teachers for our teachers aligned to our curriculum and our standards, such as foundations and math expressions. We're grateful for their help and Principal Nick Vanderpool for kicking off our fast moving process to get our kids learning. Together, we're gonna move forward. As we plan and move forward with our teachers and community, it's incredibly important to continue to develop those partnerships. And as an example, we're, we're looking forward to connecting with our Boulder Valley learning pods that are being organized. We wanna thank our community, our families, our key partners are going to make it successful for our students and families. And we wanna work with them and similar groups to meet the diverse needs of our families and our students. So let's look at the ECE slide related to the specificity around using our model. So as we've shared before with the current um, expectations provided by the health departments and other organizations, ECE will be using a model where we'll stay with the current orders and our licensing requirements for early childhood. If we have students coming in multiple times in a day, we would have to clean every toy and every asset and um, therefore it becomes a very heavy lift in the middle of the day. So we'll be providing opportunities for home learning four days a week with in-person learning half a day, once a week. And this is in phase three. In elementary, by grouping students into a group and to, into an A group and a B group, students will have home learning launch day on Monday and groups two, two days in a row weekly. So a student would come in as a launch, uh, they would have a home learning launch on Monday and then Tuesday, Wednesday would be one group and they would be face to face. And then Thursday, Friday would be the second group and they would be face to face. As we mentioned previously, we're trying to group students by family and those in need of school age care that on non-school days. One of the key things you'll notice is that our um, learning day has moved from Wednesday to Monday. We are trying to align to districts around us, knowing that we have to do building cleaning and that because of the schedule, uh, we wanna make sure that our teachers are prepared and ready to launch every week. We'll have outdoor activities, as Rob Price mentioned, as often as possible. And we know that students will benefit from play and outdoor learning. There will be parameters for recess and grouping students to keep them safe. We know the importance of specials and are working within the existing orders to provide these key structures to our students. Again, through our EOP, we will uh, provide varied entrances and staggered movement to help keep students and staff safe. In our K-8s, we have our elementary model and our 678 will be focused on a three block day. We wanna make sure that our students in their group A or group B have an opportunity to do their deep level learning and still not feel overwhelmed by having multiple classes uh, in a single day or in their off day at from home learning. In middle school, our next slide, those blocks of time have been determined, Randy, thank you. So those blocks of times, as you can see, aligned to elementary and K-8 with a Monday learning day, and then Tuesday, Wednesday, group A, Thursday, Friday, group B, in, in person learning. One of the really exciting things about our middle school principals is they've been thinking about how to process transition. We all know if we've been in middle school or have middle school children that all three years, six, seven, and eight, have their own unique opportunities for our students. So they have focused the first four weeks on transition, making sure that students are focused on building culture and community. We heard overwhelmingly parents feeling that their students needed that opportunity to reconnect. And then they will be moving to content focused in two blocks of time, four weeks at a time. The benefit of having two blocks in in-person learning is that it eases us into transition both in a more secluded system as well as in more face-to-face -face opportunities. Additionally, we'll continue to provide transition support in math, specifically related to math and ELA in home learning through our existing programs and other online opportunities. 
Students will have their content. They'll just be in four week chunks with two periods a day in their home, in their face to face learning. Over the entire semester, they will have their traditional eight classes. We can move to high school. And what I would say about high school for um, anybody again who's had a high school student, it definitely is a unique system with many nuances and program focus areas. It's very school specific and I want to send out a huge shout out to the principals of the high schools as well as their teams because they have worked tirelessly as well to bring together this idea of a plan that would be consistent throughout the system while still meeting the needs of their diverse communities. So Monday would be a home learning launch day for the week. Those would be home learning and that would be continuous two days. So a student would come in in group A, Tuesday and Wednesday, and then do home learning Thursday and Friday. This limits our student body to 50% with limited transitions, separate entrances and staggering as much as possible. We've become, we can easily become more restrictive in this group if we have to be limited limited to a 25% if a need arises. So therefore students would be coming in a single day at a time and still have that restrictive opportunity while still getting face to face. I will share that in closing today at the Broomfield graduation, a graduate spoke from the perspective of a young person moving out of high school and his acknowledgement that although unexpected circumstances have surrounded the last semester, it was providing him and his fellow classmates an opportunity to provide to prepare for adulthood in college. And for many students, that includes all their post-secondary plans. All the things that we're facing right now and looking at the level of flexibility and transition that this situation has provided, he stated that it had prepared him for college and his focus. I've used that today as my grounding for communication. Although as a parent, educator, and human, I find myself sometimes struggling to embrace all of this as an opportunity. I know that together as a community, we can succeed for our students. And now I'll hand it over to Dr. Anderson. Thank you, Margaret. Randy, if you can go ahead and uh, pull our deck up. So, so board members, our hope again is to, to move in uh, to phase three, but I will tell you uh, with a month before the school year starts, there are two key data points that are going to either allow us to move forward with our plan or prevent us from moving to, to that plan um, into a more restrictive phase, either phase two or phase one. Uh, the first data point obviously is COVID-19 health data. And I know that, um, that uh, folks who haven't been maybe tuning into our meetings or um, are just trying to figure out what's happening now, I want our community to know that we are working hand in hand with our local health officials to make these decisions. We're not gonna let politics find their way into, into why we would open or not, that we wanna make sure that what we do um, is mitigating risk and creating environments where folks can come back um, as safe as you possibly could come back um, during a pandemic. I would tell you though, board, the other piece of, of information is employee exemption data. You know, it's our, it's our desire and it's our hope that those of our individuals that work with us that are high risk are applying for exemptions. Um, we don't want folks that are high risk, risk coming back to work. We want to make sure that they're safe and that we're making exemptions for those employees. Um, however, I will say from an operational standpoint, if we get to a certain point of employees uh, that are exempting and qualify based on whether they're high risk, they're in a high risk age group, um, and those, those criteria are set forth um, by, by, um, by health officials, then it's going to really um, make it difficult for us to come back into phase three. And so as much as we're trying to move forward with phase three, there are two data points that we'll have to constantly be looking at um, to be able to see if we can actually pull that off. Uh, Randy, next slide. We think phase three is, is the right uh, option because it provides a, wi a wide range of options for our parents and students. For parents who feel like they still wanna be 100% online, um, we have opened up Boulder Universal, which is a very successful online program that we've had uh, for a long time here. And we've seen some recent uptick in interest in that program. We still welcome folks to, to go forward and apply for that. Um, we'll provide hybrid learning, which mixes some in-person uh, learning opportunities with online opportunities. And that's the, the basis of our phase three model. Um, and that we've also been able to um, work not only um, with, with health officials to ensure that we're able to do this, but also with our uh, community schools program to be able to offer 100% custodial care 
for those employees and for those parents who need that care so they can get back to work for our youngest kids. So we will have over 25 sites across our district that will provide uh, school age care um, where, where kids can actually uh, continue their online learning um, supervised by, by folks that work in that program. And uh, we feel like that that's a, it's a huge, uh, huge support for our community, something we're excited to do. Uh, so but by entering in phase three, we have a wide range of options for parents. Um, next slide, Randy. But, but I will tell you, I still think that there's a ways to go to make sure that teachers know and understand the supports that we're providing. And we still need to continue to listen to make sure they feel safe to come back. Um, as we think about childcare concerns for our employees, we intend on providing them in, in priority enrollment in our school aged care programs and a discounted rate. And we're working through the logistics on that now. In regards to PPE, I think you've heard Rob of Price already talk about providing employees masks, gloves, cloth, um, and schools being equipped with face shield, safety glasses, plexiglass partitions, and making sure there's proper signage around social distancing. Um, we feel that in phase three, that teachers will be teaching half of the kids in person that they're typically accustomed to, which we think will allow for that social distancing to be more consistent and make folks and and uh, make folks feel and actually be safer. And that everybody, by making sure that everybody's required to wear masks, we know that that is a key uh, key step in, in preventing the, the spread of COVID-19. Um, and that we also want to make sure that we're being transparent with our community, with our employees, on, on what would cause us, if we start in phase three, to, to move back to a more restrictive phase. And that we're working closely with Boulder, with Boulder County Public Health, Broomfield Public Health, um, the guidance that just came out yesterday from uh, CDE to, to communicate um, in, under what instances uh, will, will we close right away um, in the event that somebody comes down with COVID-19. And we want to be really transparent with that and really clear on that. Uh, we'd hope to have that finalized by this meeting today. Uh, CDE um, provided their guidance just uh, yesterday and in working with, with our health um, partners, and ask for a few more days so we can get on the same page and publish something. And so we'll be able to have that. And then we also need to make sure that we're working on a memor memorandum of understanding with our employees in regards to, um, uh, you know, how are we going to make sure that we're paying for leave as employees have to quarantine. We don't think that it's fair that if an employee has to quarantine because they're exposed that they necessarily have to um, use their own personal leave. So we're going to work through with our associations around what that will look like. Next slide. I would say another um, safety measure uh, designed to make sure that our employees and, and students and community are, are more safe is that we are finalizing a partnership with Gary Community Investments. Many of you may have heard um, of this partnership similar to Aurora Public Schools who's come out um, and, and has finalized that partnership. We, we're close to doing that as well, where we would be able to test all of our employees, teachers and others working directly with kids every two weeks, whether they're symptomatic or asymptomatic. Um, if there is a teacher that was exposed, we'd have access to these tests immediately. Um, and through this partnership, we would um, be guaranteed 24 to 48 hours um, turnaround in regards to those tests. And teachers would be making appointments. They wouldn't have to go to a huge place and, and, and stand in line. Um, we would actually have places that we could send them. So we feel like increased testing is something that we heard and when we were listening to the concerns of our teachers. And we feel like that that is a, um, an appropriate safety uh, precaution um, to, to that would allow us to, to open in phase three, certainly um, with more comfort from our employees. Uh, next slide, Randy. The other recommendation board that I'll be making, and this is, uh, we've, we have a resolution on the agenda today, is to delay the start of our school year by one week. And by pushing back one week, we hope to do one of two things. Number one, to provide additional training for our employees, but also to give them space um, to know, to be able to set up their rooms, to get comfortable, to be ready. Um, that pushes our start date back a week from the 17th to the 24th of August. And we would work collaboratively with our employee um, associations to figure out what those training plans would might be. Uh, we don't want to fill them all with training if, if our teachers are telling us, you know, we're going to need more time in our classrooms to be able to set this up and feel comfortable. We understand that. We want to do this collaboratively. Um, and so we're also recommending at the late start of the school year. Next slide. And, and I will say that we'll have to continue to work with our employees. And that is gonna be essential for our success. You know, this threshold of making sure people feel comfortable to come back is a real threshold that I think all school districts should be striving to meet. 
I think is critically important. Um, we're, we have been working um, with BVEA leadership and um, are, are looking to give an additional survey to our teachers. We know BVEA sent out a survey to their teachers last week. Um, we believe that uh, many of our teachers at that point were understanding that we might go back in phase four, which we felt, felt like caused a lot of concern. We heard that and listened to that. We wanna get additional feedback on the plan that we're presenting this evening from our employees to figure out what else can we do to make them feel safe. Um, we're gonna be meeting um, and making sure that we're engaged with all of our employee association leadership teams um, in even deeper level, levels than we've already had established. And uh, board members, as you know, but the public may not know that we have very close relationships with our employees and we are happy to meet with them and engage with them to, as they begin to hopefully become more comfortable with phase three. Um, we're finalizing the details on a memorandum of understanding in regards to any contractual um, changes that we need to make. Um, establishing an online portal, uh, Let's Talk um, employee webpage to continuously gather feedback and share information to have a conversation. Um, and then we are working on an FAQ document because we are getting very specific and lots of questions from our employees and we wanna be able to answer those and we wanna be able to have one document that we're working from, um, which I'm going to guess there's gonna be lots of questions from board members this evening as well. And we're gonna do the best to answer as many as we can. And for those that we can't, we'll take back to our team and make sure that those are posted on our FAQ. And we feel like that this is an important piece to being able to open successfully in a way where folks um, feel better about opening um, and that, that we're doing everything again to mitigate any of the, of the risks that are out there with COVID-19. Uh, next slide, Randy. So at this point, it's my honor to introduce Jeff Zak, who's Executive Director of Boulder County Public Health. And Jeff can share with you a little bit about how we've worked together, um, you know, his thoughts on our plan, and um, how we'll continue to partner moving forward. So Jeff, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Rob, and thanks, uh, board members. Well, the first thing I want to do is just um, give a little bit of background on what we've been doing relative to schools and introduce a couple other folks who are here with me tonight. The first one is Heather Crate who's the liaison from Boulder County Public Health to Schools for planning. And Heather's been doing a lot of this day-to-day -day work, reviewing plans, graduation plans, all of those things. So really want to thank Heather for all the work uh, that Heather's been doing. And then Dr. Chris Urbina, who is my chief medical officer and previously uh, the director of Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Very lucky to have Chris with Boulder County Public Health, also representing Broomfield and the chief medical officer role um, for Jason Volling, who's the director of Broomfield Public Health. And Jason had planned to be here today because we work really closely together, um, not just with Jason, but across our whole metro region. Uh, but he could not be here, so uh, wanted to pass that along, but he, he's been very involved in this work. So as Rob had mentioned, we've been working extremely closely with both school districts, both Boulder Valley School District, as well as St. Rain Valley School District. Um, we've been planning actively, as you heard, for graduations for the fall semester and back to school. We've also been meeting with the Denver Metro Partnership for Health, which is the public health directors from Adams, Arapahoe, Douglas, Broomfield, Boulder, Denver, uh, and Jefferson counties, and um, meeting with a pediatrician representative of the local chapter of the Colorado um, American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, as well as meeting with public health and hospital physicians, epidemiologists, um, experts with the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. We've met multiple times with the Colorado Department of Education. Um, we've been meeting with researchers from the Colorado School of Public Health and their affiliates. Um, and we've been meeting, uh, in addition to that, with the Metro Area Superintendent. So have been doing a lot of work in this area. In addition, we are researching the latest guidance from uh, national expert organization. So we've been looking at the Harvard School of Public Health, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics, as I mentioned, um, as well as the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. So we're staying linked to the expert organizations at the national level uh, who are making specific recommendations regarding reopening of schools. Um, we've developed our own metro level school opening guidance, and that was uh, because uh, we did not get the Colorado Department of Education guidance until just this week, which has, um, as I know most of you on the call are feeling, uh, as well as those who are tuning in, that has been a challenging situation. And we felt like it was important to provide guidance early on so that schools could start to formulate decisions. Luckily, our guidance is very aligned um, with the Department of Education guidance. Um, and we did have two local public health directors as well as the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment representation 
on that uh, statewide level work group, which was good. Um, before I talk about school opening more specifically, I wanted to share uh, something that we look at when we're making decisions relative to many things, whether it's opening schools or how we go about allowing things to be open in our own community, and that's local conditions that are relative to the disease. And I just want to go through a few of these things fairly quickly, um, but they're important because it sets the context for why we are feeling comfortable as we move forward. Um, although we're not seeing in Boulder County specifically a steady decline in our cases and case counts um, for the last two weeks, we are definitely at a manageable level of cases. Our five day rolling average, average of daily case, cases right now, and this is through the end of the day on uh, July 20th, is 13.2 cases per day. And the case counts for the last seven days um, and I'm just gonna go through these so you can sort of see the illustration of the last seven days. Apologize, I don't have this in slides today, but if you just search Boulder County Public Health um, COVID-19, you can find all this data online that I'm talking about in graph format. Um, the, on July 13th, it was 24 cases. On the 14th, it was 18 cases. On July 15th, we were at 29 cases. That was our high. Um, on July 16th, we were at 20 cases. July 17th, we're at 11. July 18th, 11. July 19th, 12. July 20th, 12. So again, uh, not a steady decline in cases, um, but we do have very manageable caseloads at this point. And just from a staffing standpoint, when we started, or before we started this, the division that runs um, the work that comes out of an event like this is called our community uh, our sorry, Communicable Disease and Emergency Management Division. In November of 2019, we were at 12.3 FTE. Um, and our staff as of today is a little more than 34 FTE. So we've been working really diligently to staff up and make sure that we have supports to be able to deal with the outbreaks in Boulder County that we would see um, and to assure we have capacity as we move forward. We're not completely where we wanna be, but we're building significant capacity and certainly felt comfortable in being able to handle um, the outbreaks that we're seeing now and um, spikes going forward. Part of that is because we have a contract for closed loop case investigations um, with CU specifically. So we're one of the only folks in the state who have developed that so that CU can actually help us do case investigations and contact tracing that's associated with CU specifically. We also have roughly 400 AmeriCorps volunteers um, in the state of Colorado, another 50 Colorado School of Public Health trained um, students that have been helping us and have helped us in the past. Um, and then we have mutual aid agreements with our local public health agency partners. <clears throat> so we were pretty well um, planning for how we need to move forward in the future until the point where we have a vaccine in place and, is, and it's available, widely available and effective in our community. So the other thing that's key in terms of capacity for looking at whether, um, whether local communities are ready for this is testing capacity. Our current five day test positivity rate is 3.2%. Um, and the goal for that, sorry, that's my dog. Um, the goal for the five day average is to remain under 5%. And without going into a lot of background on that, um, if we're less than 5%, it means that we're doing enough testing to assure that we're identifying um, folks in the community who have the virus. Uh, we definitely have capacity to meet all of our thresholds for testing symptomatic people in Boulder County. Um, we've been able to do that readily. We can um, also uh, do have the capacity to test asymptomatic close contacts of people who are positive, which helps us control the spread of the disease. Our biggest challenge in the last two weeks has been around turnaround time for lab results, um, which are definitely delayed. That is a statewide issue that we've been advocating with the governor's off office on. But, but as uh, Rob noted, um, BVSD has really stepped forward and is working with Gary Community Investments um, to provide testing uh, for the school district that has a 24 to 48 hour turnaround time, which is phenomenal. Um, so I think we're in a great place because of the proactiveness of the district. Um, and then just a summary on where we're seeing our cases come from. So just for those of you who are on the line and listening, have a sense of that. Most of our cases come from household transmission. We know that, um, especially in our older population, um, when we see the virus brought into the household, that it's just like in a long-term care facility, 
Um, it's harder to control because it's in a confined area. Um, so that is the majority of where the cases that we see come from. The other outbreaks that we've been seeing, I think you're probably all very familiar with the Hill and the outbreak that happened on the Hill over a month ago now. Um, that was one that tested our system and we were able to uh, work with the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment and bring in some of those Colorado School of Public Health folks to help us control that spread. Um, and our numbers are back down from that. Some of the other places we see exposures are from workplace, um, some restaurants and some gatherings. All of those are manageable um, quite easily for us. Um, we have the ability to do the contact tracing and case investigations um, and follow up. Uh, and at least 20 of those cases that we're seeing lately in the last period of time between roughly the third week of June and July 11th have been associated with travel both in state but also out of state. Um, so that is something we're keeping an eye on. Um, and that's how the disease was brought into uh, Colorado initially. So we do want to make sure that we're uh, messaging about the importance of uh, not traveling, not getting on planes now. Um, and going to places where there is higher exposure rates. Um, <clears throat> our hospitalizations are, is the last key um, and they remain low in Boulder County. They've been low throughout uh, this disease outbreak. Our hospitals are doing an incredible job. We meet with them weekly. We're tracking multiple um, uh, indicators for our hospitals. Um, and just to give you an example, our cumulative hospitalization rate in Boulder County for COVID specific cases is 55.2 per 100,000 population. And that compares to 106.3 in Colorado per 100,000 and 113.6 nationally. So we're, we're doing really well in Boulder County and we've been consistently low in terms of the entire metro area for, for many of these data points that I'm talking about. So what I want to, to share with you about um, opening schools in the fall and again, we've been paying a lot of attention to Harvard School of Public Health, the American Academy of Pediatrics, again, talking with physicians, uh, hospital folks, and others locally is, and I, I know all of you on the phone as educators are keenly aware of this, but we know that keeping schools closed comes with massive uh, individual and societal costs. Uh, we know that children uh, in some cases have lost more than a year. Uh, of growth based on the fact that we've even had schools closed for as long as we have. Um, and we know that it's really important for our children uh, to keep schools open uh, if we can do it in a way that reduces risk. So that's been the focus and has been where public health direc directors from across the nation have been spending a fair amount of time looking and talking about. Um, and we know also that, that no risk uh, is zero risk, right? So we've been focused really strongly on what are risk reduction strategies that will help us achieve lower risk uh, with kids going back to school in the fall. And that's been a lot of the strategies uh, that you just heard about from Rob and um, from both Robs and from Margo. And we've been working with them really closely. They've been following that guidance. Um, and this is, uh, as you all know, this is a novel virus. We're learning new information weekly, and, and we don't know um, what information we're gonna continue to learn as we move forward. So what Rod's, Rob said is absolutely critical as we move forward, we're gonna learn new information, we're gonna be in close contact um, with the district, we're gonna share that information, we're gonna watch what's happening on the ground. Um, we have got a, a staff person that's been hired, uh, epidemiologist, to work with both school districts as well as the university. Um, because we want to make sure that as we're moving forward with this, that we're doing everything we can to make sure we know what's happening on the ground, we're monitoring those things, and we're staying in close contact. Um, but we, we are specifically focused on looking at what is the risk of kids uh, in these different areas. And we know from at least the latest research that we've been looking at that um, the kids that are 10 and less appear to have lower rates of transmission than do kids 10 and above. I would guess that many of you have seen some of that on the news. Um, there's been research that's been coming out. We've been watching it just like everybody else. We do follow-ups and talk with those folks. Uh, we get the research papers. We're looking at them closely. Um, we're also uh, paying close attention to make sure that we're seeing what's happening with children. So we know that there's much less significant effects with children, but that doesn't mean that there's no complications at all with children. So we're watching the data on that as well and paying close attention to that. Uh, Chris uh, 
Urbina, our chief medical officer has been helping with that and uh, we'll be able to talk about some of that too, if you'd like to. Um, the, the other things that I think are important for us to know is that this is different from influenza and I know it's been really challenging for people because COVID uh, being again, novel and new, learning new information, it comes out often. You're hearing different perspectives come from people who are experts. And because those different perspectives are coming from places where we're looking at what's happening in case investigations, we're looking at what's happening on the ground and we're finding out new information uh, that's changing the perspective of the strategy that we might have to put in place or what we know about the disease specifically. And we know, for instance, that influenza, children can definitely readily spread, spread the flu, um, but it appears to be different at this point for COVID-19. So again, paying close attention to all of that, we'll be sharing that with the district um, as we move forward. Um, and uh, we'll be making sure that again, we're paying close attention to our epidemiologists who are gonna be sharing with us uh, other things that, would, that they're seeing on the ground as we learn new information. It's gonna definitely be a combination of looking at the data, as Rob said, talking about what we see happening on the ground, looking at the new research, and then making adjustments based on that. The only other thing I would add that um, I think will be very helpful for us in the next week and a half or so, is that Denver Health is working with the Colorado Health Institute to develop some school modeling based on local data from Colorado that will help us be able to make some predictions about what that might look like for school districts, both for Boulder Valley School District as well as St. Grand Valley School District in terms of how many outbreaks might we actually expect. We know that it's not going to be zero. We do we are planning for the fact that we will have some outbreaks, uh, and, but we are planning to minimize the effect of those outbreaks, as well as to try to predict what we think will happen in those, those outbreaks. So we'll be sharing more of that modeling once we get it. Um, there'll be more conversations around that. That can be drilled down even to a school level to do some work on the school level with. So more to come on that. Um, there's also uh, obviously no perfect plan uh, to reopen schools. You, you've probably seen that by just looking at the national news and seeing how challenging this situation is for everybody across the United States. Um, we, we know that uh, it's been really difficult to get guidance timely. Um, there's many, many folks who've been working on this. Organizations who are responsible for education are trying to put together guidance. They're trying to get feedback from experts who have health backgrounds and the timeliness of that has been a challenge. So we know as, as we go forward that it's not going to be a perfect system as we move forward. And that's why it's so important to work closely together to monitor what's happening um, and to make sure that we're doing everything we can, not only to reduce the spread of the disease as we're moving this forward, but to make sure that there's as least disruption on schools as possible. So when, we when the, the district was talking about cohorting students and making sure that we're keeping uh, folks grouped together, that's gonna be really important to minimize that disruption if something does happen. Um, and then we, we don't know what's gonna happen between now and the fall, um, but we, we, it could be that schools would need to close unexpectedly depending on what happens with that data. So it's gonna be really important um, for all of us to be flexible and nimble in how we respond to this. And I know that's extremely difficult in a situation um, where parents, children, um, staff all have to make decisions about what their life uh, situation is going to be. So uh, we're, we're just gonna have to continue to work through this together um, as we move into the next months. And then the last thing I wanna say is, I, I have been extremely um, appreciative um, and extremely uh, thankful that our district has done such an incredible job. So the districts ultimately have the decision to make some of these decisions. And I can tell you that our districts, both St. Grain and Boulder Valley have committed that they would work in, in close partnership with Boulder County Public Health. Um, and we are working hand in hand, just like we were on the front end of this whole thing when it started, uh, we decided together to close the schools uh, in March um, and we are working hand in hand now. So I am very appreciative of all the folks who just talked to you. I'm very appreciative of the support of the Board of Education um, and know that we are working really, really closely. And I'm certainly confident in the BDSD plan as it's put forth today and know that we'll stay in close contact as we move forward. Um, and at this point, I just wanna make sure I give 
um, Heather or Chris the opportunity to any add anything major that I've missed here. Go ahead, Heather, and then I'll follow you. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Um, I think that you hit on all of the major pieces as far as um, the commitment from the district to work hand in hand. I've worked really closely with all of the partners um, around this planning and just knowing that we're gonna need to be flexible and, and see what's happening. Um, but as far as where we're at today, it looks like a, a solid plan to operate from. Thank you, Heather. I also wanted to echo Jeff's uh, uh, compliments to Rob and his team, because I think you've done an outstanding job of paying attention to the learning needs of, your, of, the, of our students, but also the pain and listening very carefully to our teachers, our, our staff, and, and our community. That, it's, a, it's a delicate balance. And when we're struggling with uh, not a whole lot of information, it's not a perfect system out there. And I think we're working hand in hand, not only in closing the schools, as Jeff alluded to earlier, but also reopening the schools is, is essential to us reducing the risk for everyone involved, including our communities beyond the schools. So hats off to you, Rob, and your team. And we look forward to continuing to work with you uh, as we watch the data and as we watch our schools. It'll, it, it, it's not over. The plan just begins. <laughs> you know, we have to pay attention to that data and, and check in frequently. So I'll be around to answer any questions that the board or the community might have. Rob, is that it? So that's it for our presentation. Tina, if you want to facilitate questions, and then I'll try to steer the questions to the appropriate either staff member and Jeff and Chris and Heather can handle any that are, are for our, our health, um, our health uh, partners. Okay, and, and just to clarify to the public, we are not voting on this um, plan that's being presented tonight. This is an update to where we are today based on the conditions we see around us and based on the feedback you just heard from Jeff Sayak and uh, Dr. Rob Anderson. So um, I will uh, start, I'll go in reverse alphabetical only because Stacy has her hand up. Um, Stacy, why don't you start? And, and just to, let's be mindful of the time. We don't have a ton of time. We have a hard stop at five. So but definitely focus on your most important questions and then we can follow up with questions with Rob via email. Yep. Thank you and thanks to everybody for the well, well thought out presentation and very informative. Um, one, so I'll just start by saying that as a parent, I am on board with phase three. As a board member, I am not at phase three yet. I am at one or two. Um, and so part of that is I don't, I didn't see anything in the presentation that specifically says that BBEA and our other employee groups are on board with phase three. And that concerns me. I am worried that unless we have support and are in partnership with BBEA and the other employee groups as well, that we have a risk of having an us versus them um, environment, which won't be productive at all. And I, I feel that happening. And so I'm, I'm, cons I'm really concerned about that. Um, so I'm wondering, what is the BBEA position? What is the position of the other employee groups? Do they support phase three? If they don't, what conditions need to happen in order for phase three to be acceptable? Um, and I worry that if they are not in support of phase three, that we won't have enough teachers to even make it happen. So that's my main concern. I have other questions too, but since we don't have a lot of time, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Stacy. Just to respond really quick, I think that I shared um, you know, in, in the presentation you know, our commitment to, to try to get there, right? I don't, I don't think that we um, want to be in a position um, where, uh, where our, our, the majority of, of our staff don't feel comfortable, right? And I think that there's a, there is a lot of justified fear around this uh, for, for folks that work in our district and, and teachers across the country. I, I would say that as you all heard from Jeff and Chris, um, we're, we're not making these decisions in a vacuum. We're working hand in hand with our health partners to make sure that the that we're mitigating the risks. And I am committed to continuing to work with not just BBEA, but BVPEA, our classified associations, all of our employees, um, to try to understand 
based on the plan we're presenting to you today, and understand that no one, no one has seen this plan yet, based on the plan today, what else do we need to do, right? And um, for those that, that are at high risk, how do we make sure that we get those folks exemptions, right? You know, again, you know, we're not trying to put um, folks that are at risk medically in, in this situation. This plan is contingent upon those folks um, filing those exemption forms, filing the paperwork that we've already been working towards. Um, but please know that I'll be continuing to work towards that because certainly we want to go forward together. Um, and we know there's a lot of fear around that. That's why we've leaned on the experts and their expertise in regards to developing this plan. Okay, um, Kitty, go on mute. Okay, um, so I have a question for the public health people. If any of you read today's camera, I think it was today, maybe it was yesterday with Chuck Wibby's column about COVID-19 and well he was he seemed to be minimizing the impact of it and you know I am no expert in public health but it seemed to me reading it that that column lacked context and I wonder if anyone in, in public health who read it would have a comment on that. I did not see that article um, but I know that, that Chris could talk about, certainly from a medical perspective, the impact relative to COVID-19. Yeah, I'm just concerned because, you know, people read it and he doesn't have any expertise either. And, you know, we're going to be hearing from parents making, you know, they make decisions based on stuff they hear or read somewhere. And it may or may not be an informed opinion. So, but if you didn't read it, that's fine. My other question is, do you, what is the R not? I mean, not explain it. Yep. What's the number? Uh, I did, the number for Colorado is just below two. Okay. Um, so that's that's where it is right now. And if you want me to explain it, I'm happy to. But I'll yeah, stop. I know what it is. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, can I move on, Kitty? Kitty, I did not also read the article, but we work our hardest to try to set out uh, correct information. Uh, people have a right to their opinion. Uh, and as you know, you'll see it a lot on local, statewide, and national news. But we'll continue to, uh, I'll try to see if I can find that article and, and we'll continue to put out information that, that is accurate and continue to commit to answering questions and working with, with Rob and his team, as well as the, the associations to see if we can answer their questions as well. Thank you. And I have a question for Rob. Do we have any sense of how many teachers are going to request exemptions? At, at this point, we have 90 teachers with approved exemptions, and I believe that we have another 100 that we're, that we're in review. Um, so certainly a significant number of employees. Uh, again, that is why we added that into the data that we'll have to look at and consider um, as we think about being able to deliver on phase three. And then what number is the tipping point? It's a great question, Kitty. It just kind of depends on how many of our, our parents actually sign up for um, Boulder Universal. There's an opportunity to move some of those folks online. Um, you know, I'm hesitant to, to make the promise to, to either our employees or our community that, well, if you don't want to be in person, just let us know and we'll let you go online because I don't know logistically that will work, um, nor that that's operationally viable, which was one of our you know, four core principles. And so we're working at, on that, um, certainly something that we'll have to monitor. And if we are getting close to the point where we feel like um, we have so many teachers in this high risk category that it's un we're unable to deliver um, um, on phase three, um, given that data, I'll be make sure that I'll not, not only let the board know, but the public know. And I'll save my other questions for emails. Okay, uh, Lisa. Thank you. Uh, my first question maybe is for Dr. Zayek. What do we do in terms of when do kids stay home? What temperature do they need to have? Does it matter if they're coughing a lot, if they have a runny nose, if they're exhausted? What are our standards for having parents keep their kids home? And if they keep a kid home, do the siblings stay home? And then I'm wondering how long that staying home period lasts before they can return to school. Those are great questions. And as much as I aspire to be like Dr. Urbina, I, I am not an actual medical doctor. So I'm gonna defer that question to Dr. Urbina. Sure, that's a great question. I, I do think we have to come up with guidelines. Currently, like in any situation, if people have a fever, that's what, uh, that's defined as anything over 
or have any of those symptoms, including cough, runny nose, or any of those COVID-like 19 symptoms, um, then we would ask them to stay at home. And, and, and if it's also true of any of the family members, including the parents, so that, that we're, we're attempting to do our best at trying to keep people who are sick um, to stay at home. Now, the challenge will be, as we come up with influenza in the fall, how are we going to be able to tell when it's flu and when it's COVID-19? So we're going to be sharing some information as we go out. I think we'll be hopefully sharing some guidelines with Rob uh, 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 regarding how to stay, what those recommendations are for staying home and be clearer about that. And probably have to send this out with information out to parents as well so that they can know what those expectations are. Uh, that basically, what is that trigger that says they should stay at home? Thank you. Um, Rob, I guess I'm wondering a little bit about some of the enforcement around uh, sending kids to school and around um, mask wearing in the classroom. So I'm curious if a teacher suspects that a kid is, is ill or if the kid walks in the door coughing, what sorts of things are they expected and allowed to do to keep themselves and the rest of the kids in the classroom safe? And what kinds of standards would we have for demanding that a parent come and pick a child up from school? Oh, great questions, Lisa. And I would say that, you know, as, as we've now are, are announcing phase three, um, that more specific, we're working closely with Dr. Abina, uh, with Jeff on more specific guidance on what schools are and able to do. Obviously with our passive screening, um, when, we've, when we suspect somebody at school um, has, has either has not done the screening or um, are showing symptoms that we're going to have to intervene. Um, luckily, we have uh, uh, Stephanie Farron and, and we have lots of our, um, our, our school nurse staff that can help with that on the ground. Um, and we'll make sure that schools are really clear, teachers are really clear and understand. I would imagine questions like this are going to be part of our training as we bring teachers back on, on what do you do if, um, and thinking through even some simulation scenarios um, of all the things that, that we might consider uh, would be guidance that we'll be, give, we'll be giving um, to our teachers um, and sharing with our parents as well. Okay, and then um, I guess my last question is, what tools are we giving teachers to deal with issues in the classroom around non-compliance of mask wearing and social distancing? And then as a corollary, how does that connect to the work we've been doing recently around disciplinary changes and ensuring that we are not targeting students um, unfairly in the way that they're dealt with for failure to comply with mask issues or social distancing, et cetera? I think we're going to have to be incredibly careful, right? You know, to understand that that with kids, certainly we want to make sure that they're socially distanced and wearing masks. That's going to be the expectation. Um, if we're having consistent issues with kids wearing masks, I think that's something that has to be addressed. But to your point, we want to we don't want to be too heavy handed for kids, especially young kids who are for whatever reason unable to wear those masks. And so, you know, given those circumstances, we're gonna work with those on a case by case basis. I think that, but, but you know, the, the, the core of your question is to ensure that we do this in an equitable way, I think is important to all of us. Um, but at the same time, we've gotta make sure that, that masking is, is an important part to the safety of this plan. If, if we were to propose a plan where, where kids weren't required to wear masks, um, it wouldn't, I don't believe it would lead um, it would reach the level of safety that we feel like we need to have to be able to ask our employees to come in. Um, so certainly um, something that we'll be considering and, and contemplating and talking about. I don't have uh, the direct answer right now, but I certainly your point is well taken that we need to be very, very careful as we think about too, being too heavy handed enforcement um, in regards to that. I guess those are my most important questions, but I, I do have like 30. So maybe my last question is, I would love to get all of my questions answered. I would also love to hear all, everything that everybody else has written down that they're not gonna get to ask. And I think the public would too. So do we have some way to get all of this sent back out to everybody so that we can get everyone's questions and answers? I, I think the best way to do that would be as we're compiling our FAQ that we'll make as a public transparent document that we would get those questions there and we work on answering those. And so um, even the nuance, you know, the nuance specific questions will we'll be able to group together and answer those for our public. Okay, uh, Donna. Uh, yeah, I thank you for all the hard work that's gone into this. I'm very impressed by the presentation and I really appreciate that Rob explained uh, the difference between feeling and being. Recently, I had to be in the hospital for several uh, I, I won't go into details, but several times in two days, 
And though I didn't feel safe, they did everything they could to make sure that, that, that we were safe. And, and so there's a huge difference between feeling and, and working with the community to be as safe as possible. So I appreciate that. And I see both perspectives. I, I'm concerned about teachers not feeling safe and not wanting to come back to work. And I know as a lifetime educator within this district, I know the joy of one-to-one in-person learning where you see the eyes light up of a student when they get it and you can encourage them on the spot. I, I also know the frustration of a student when they're about to give up and on the spot you can help them move on, like help someone finish a marathon. And, and sometimes that online learning isn't the same. So I appreciate that our district is working hard to get us back to an in-person environment. Uh, that, that is so important. And to sum it up, I, I just see the value in that. And my questions are around with the teachers that have exemptions and the teachers that don't feel safe and just don't want to come back in, do we have any idea? Can, can we employ long-term subs for some of those positions and can they be trained in this online uh, approach as needed as quickly as possible and and then the the other question um well I'll, I'll let you answer that one first and then i'll ask the second question thank you oh uh, thanks donna for that question i think substitute is, is a question that that we've been asked pretty frequently um you know i think that people's fear is is if you let substitute substitute all throughout the district that potentially, um, if they do end up contracting COVID, that they could impact multiple sites. And so I think that those are logistics that we're having to, to work through. How do, we, um, how do we partner with substitutes to stay within either one school or a small set of schools? Um, and then how, to the extent that we're going to be able to um, gather substitutes to work, you know, we'll, we're always recruiting for substitutes. So anybody watching who's interested, please let us know. I can't go to our website. Um, but we're working with Mike Rodas, and we'll get more specifics on the details of our substitute plan. It's something I also think that we should work with our teachers on, our teachers association, and I want to hear their thoughts as well. So, Thanks, Rob. Um, the other last question is, on that one day that, that's the Monday, kind of the planning day, is that the day for the uh, ultimate cleaning or the, the uh, extra cleaning and will will teachers are, are we working they would they be in the building or, or more at home during that day to allow for deeper cleaning how, how will that Monday being uh, kind of where no one's there's no in-person learning how, how might that look for staff it's a great question again Donna I think that I've heard from teachers who have implored us to allow them to be in the buildings five days a week. And even if they're doing online learning, that it's important for them um, to be in the building, to be able to have access to all the things um, that, that they're, they typically have. Um, I think that, that that's gonna be a challenge for us to determine balancing that versus the need to clean. I would say that we have to make sure that our buildings are clean and safe. And so that would take priority, but there may be ways we can think about that differently. Um, but, but that Monday would be, um, that in part where we would do some of that deep cleaning and then if there's classrooms or if there's spaces that we're letting folks um, work in, we'd have to schedule that so that they could still be cleaned as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That answers my questions. And, and I really want to say a uh, thanks to Rob Price on showing the visual of the, the screens and uh, how, how that will look. I think that helps a lot of people to actually see the visual. Thanks. That's Kathy? all. Thanks, Donna. Kathy? I'm just trying to be mindful of the time here. Um, so Rob, I know that we are just now looking at phase three. So my question is, what is the plan going forward to keep the public and the board informed as we come up with some of these um, answers to questions? What's the process so that people can stay up to date? Well, I think that, you know, our web presence and developing an FAQ to answer the questions today, um, I do think it makes sense to potentially look at another check in, um, you know, maybe in two weeks, depending upon board availability to just give the public an update on, on what the data is sharing. I can give an update on kind of uh, the progress that we've made in regards to making people feel safe. I think that makes a, a sense if we're able to work that out. Um, if not, I'll, be, I'll communicate directly to, to our families and to our community um, on where we are. Um, but certainly for the board to keep the board in the loop, um, especially if anything is changing, I think that certainly um, you know, we want to make sure that we make that a priority. 
I would um, not surprisingly support an update, probably two weeks. One week might be too quick because of the rapidity with which things are changing. Um, because some of the questions I have include what happens when, how many students in a cohort need to be diagnosed as having COVID before you have to shut that down and what does that look like? And, and the matrix questions that we've talked about that I don't think we've had a chance to decide yet because we're just looking at the phase three right now. So um, I think if we could come up with some kind of best kind of schedule for people to understand, here's when we are gonna know certain things, I think that would lower the anxiety. So you're suggesting somewhat a timeline of, of where we're going to check in and where we're going to update folks um, absent of any significant shifts in data in which that, you know, um, you know, I'll just I'll take us back to the, the middle of March where, um, you know, at lunchtime, I thought we were fine. And then Jeff called me at two and by six o'clock, um, uh, both St. Fran and Boulder Valley were shutting down because the data um, told us we needed to. And I just want to reiterate that we'll, we'll we'll be able to work quickly if that's the case. Um, and whatever those numbers are, if we hit those, we'll be quick to act. We're not going to be hand wringing. We have plans um, with our fa our five phase approach that'll let us to, to move quickly. Uh, but but yes, Kathy, I think that um, especially this matrix piece, certainly an update to the public is going to be important. Well, and then like you just said, Rob, an understanding for the community for when we're going back and forth between phases so that they understand that. So I appreciate that. Are there going to be masks available at school for those kids that forgot their masks at home or the um, when they come? So yes, we're I, wearing I lots of lot masks. Yep. Okay, all right. Um, I'll just wait till we have our next update, but thanks. I found the, this to be super helpful and I appreciate um, Jeff and Dr. Urbina and everybody being on the call. I just, I know that they've got a lot on their plate. So I really appreciate every all the hard work. So thank you. Okay. Yeah, and just to note, we are going to be scheduling more time. Our next scheduled board meeting, so the public knows, is August 11th, which is a Tuesday, but we'll be finding a time between then and now to um, reflect any new learnings and um, things like that. Uh, Richard. Thank you, everybody, for the wonderful presentation. I also uh, am a little bit more clear now in terms of what's happening with uh, uh, the reintroduction. I do have a couple of questions. One is you... Uh, you, uh, I believe it, the health department mentioned local conditions uh, that a lot of it depends on the local condition. Uh, and my question is, uh, if you could remind me, because in, in mid-March when we decided that we were going to go to online or remote learning, what were the conditions then that made us do that? And what are the conditions now? I'm, I'm trying to remember in terms of, so boom, it happened and something was going on then and what is going on now? What's the difference? What's different? Sure, thanks Richard. And that'll make me try to remember too. Uh, but when we were shutting down in March and one of the things I wanna say on the front end of this that's really important to recognize as well is in the beginning of March, we really didn't know what was gonna happen with this disease. We were in a, we were in a period where we're seeing more community spread happen um, and it was very concerning because we didn't know how the disease was going to act. And I think, I believe that BVSD and SVVSD were the first schools to close in the state, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but we made that decision based on what we were seeing in terms of climbing rates. That's very similar to what we would make a decision on now. I mentioned those components of testing, um, case, new case numbers. Um, the ability to do contract tra contact tracing and monitoring, those are all really important components. If we started to see uncontrolled, then we actually have a monitoring system. It's in our surge plan um, that has different levels. There's a yellow level uh, or a green level, a yellow level, and a red level. And depending on which level you're in, it escalates up the actions that would need to occur. And that's a plan that we end up having to share um, with the state and we're monitoring again, uh, across the metro area. But it's based on those things and looking at, for instance, with case rates, um, if we had cases coming from uncontrolled spread, we didn't know where they were coming from. People were being exposed, but not knowing where they were exposed. We were seeing lots of that occur to the point where we were having trouble con controlling the contact tracing and making getting tests back fast enough um, to do isolation and quarantine. Uh, then we would be more concerned because the more the spread occurs in the community. So if you think about an Arizona or a Florida, something like that, 
you have a lot of virus in the community and the, with that much virus in the community, you have a lot more chance um, for the virus to spread quickly and with a lot less controls around it. We're not in that scenario um, in Boulder County, um, but if we started to move to that scenario, we would be having conversations across the metro region to talk about that. We would be looking at our own data um, and we would be sharing that with for sure Rob and, and Don Haddad with St. Bray Valley School District as we were moving forward. And Chris, is there anything else or Heather that you would wanna to add to that? I, I think, think oh. ahead, Heather. I think I would just add that in March, we didn't really have an idea of how the virus was going to act in children. Um, and so a precautionary measure, understanding sort of historically how things like the flu spread so quickly between children that we um, wanted to take that mitigation factor of, of getting these large groups of children not in a space together. We've now learned a lot more about the virus. We're continuing to learn. We're better understanding mitigation strategies like physical distancing and masking and all of these other steps that can be taken to reduce some of this risk. So I think as far as looking at um, then versus the fall, those are some of the, the major differences as well. Uh, I would agree with Heather, uh, Richard. I do think that the novelty, the newness of the virus uh, pulled the trigger early and I think appropriately at the time. Uh, we ha clearly have more cases now, but as Heather stated, we have a plan, we have staff, we have monitoring, we have a whole lot more information, including the, how the disease is spread than we did initially. So I think it was a good idea at the time and I would still say we did the right thing, uh, but now we're doing the right thing as well as looking again at the data. Thank you, I'm gonna stop there, but I do have a bunch of other questions. Okay. Um, and then I just have uh, one question. I'm and just want to thank everyone for all the work they did coming up with this plan. Sorry about the weird lighting on my face. Um, Jeff and Heather and Chris, I'm a motivated parent and would love to see in person learning, but I also don't want teachers to be suffering through outbreaks. What could we as a community do differently for the next four weeks to create even better conditions for our kids to go back to school? So I think um, I'll, I'll take a shot at that first. I think one of the things that we can absolutely do is work with our kids. I, I've seen other districts that have, as an example, um, use masks with their kids before they're in school. So getting them used to it, talking to them about the importance of it as one way, but also just really getting um, and, and educating our community and our kids and our parents about the importance of the masking, social distancing and hand washing. Those three things together are absolutely critical as we go into school. Um, and the more we can make sure we're emphasizing the importance of those things, uh, the better off we're gonna be. But I, as, as I know many of you are aware of on the phone, that with younger kids and masks, that will be a challenge. So the more we can, the more we can work with our kids ahead of time, the better off we're gonna be. And I think for me, really a lot of communication and sort of shifts around not sending children to school when they're sick. I think we, um, and for staff and, and teachers as well, just making sure that we have uh, systems in place to help support folks when they need to be out and not sort of pushing through any illnesses or taking any fever reducers to make sure that we can make it through the day and really just communicating how important it is to exclude yourself and your children when you're sick. I'd like to say, uh, Tina, I, th I think seeking uh, accurate information is, is a key to being successful. I think Rob and his team have put together a great plan. We certainly have a good information on our website and not only in Boulder, but in Broomfield. And I think if parents can talk to their kids about how this, what this virus is and how it's spread, then we can go a long way to make a difference in our communities. There are a lot of folks that are out there and you know who they are, who are naysaying that this is not a real virus, yet it is a real disease and, and with real people that are sick. So I think we can pay, if we pay attention to that and we do reduce the risk and it becomes less of an issue, yeah, we've done the right thing. Well, thank you. Um, so our next item is our consent agenda and um, Rob, do we have 10 minutes to go through it? And then knowing that we might meet in one to two weeks, are there items if they're pulled that we can carry over? And just so the public knows, there's a graduation uh, the superintendent and a board member needs to go.
get to. So I think I'm okay for 10 minutes. I think that as, as long as we're done, you know, by 520 ish, I think we're fine. Okay, great. So I'm going to read off the items on the consent agenda. And then we'll be getting more information and answers to FAQs from both the community and also from the board will be on our website. So the items are 6.1 personnel my items, 6.2 approval of minutes, June 23, 2020 regular meeting, 6.3 approval of equal opportunity schools collaboration agreement, 6.4 resolution 2036.5 grants, but BBSD special education, IDEA, Preschool Colorado Department of Education, 6.6 .6 Grant Health Services, School Health Professionals, Colorado Department of Education, 20.67 Grant Special Education, IDEA Part B, Colorado Department of Education, 26.8 Grant Student Services, Thriving Schools, Rise, Kaiser Permanente, 20. Are there any items that board members would like to pull? Anyone? I don't have any items that I, I, I'd like to pull, uh, Tina, but I would like for uh, uh, Rob to explain a little bit about the uh, uh, school equality. Equal opportunity schools? There you go. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's first get a motion to approve these items by Kathy and seconded by Kitty. Uh, Richard, do you want to ask some brief questions to Rob? And I'm happy to provide an overview, uh, Tina, as well. Great, uh, great. You know, for, for the board, as, as we know, it, um, one of the strategic plan metrics that we're working towards is making sure that um, the kids have, a, have opportunities, all kids have opportunities to access advanced coursework. Um, Equal Opportunity Schools is a partner that is partnered with districts across the country um, that has, has, has figured out a way um, through not only surveying, engaging kids, but looking at data that would share um, a, a child's or a student's ability to be successful in an advanced course um, uh, to give strategies, schools, uh, different strategies on how we could begin to diversify um, our advanced coursework to make sure more students of poverty, more students of color um, are in our advanced courses. And so this is, I know, a priority of this board and, and I know that it's a priority of our community. We feel like our partnership, this partnership is going to allow us uh, to, to make significant progress in that area. Okay, great. Um, that sounds like some exciting work. Richard, do you have any follow up questions? No, the overview helped. Thanks. Okay. Donna, were you trying to say something? No. Okay, great. No. Uh, Laura, would you please? Oh, I'm sorry, were there any other questions about items on the consent agenda? Okay, hearing none, Laura, would you please call the roll? Certainly. Garcia. Yes. Gephardt. Yes. Marquis. Yes. Myers. Yes. Yeah. Sergeant. Yes. Sweeney Moran. Yes. Zis. Yes. Motion passes. All right. Thanks everyone for your time and a special thanks to Jeff, Heather, and Chris for joining us. Um, we'll be announcing to the public the next update from the board and um, soon once we find a time. So with that, we're adjourned and everyone be safe.